Okay, happy birthday. There's no better way to celebrate your birthday than at an egg conference. Yeah, so, yeah. can you welcome John Ike as our... Uh, so we're here at William Jessup. John's getting ready to do his keynote. I, I should have had to dance at my birthday party. That was... Let's give it up one more time for Mr. Jessup. Woo! That was something. We got a microphone. That's exciting. We got a little clicker. Oh, it really works. Hi, everybody! Hi. Good morning! Wow, hey, don't start the timer yet. Um, before we even get started, before we get to the keynote and all the talking and all the learning and stuff, I just gotta tell you, I'm like, hashtag, like, uber honored to be given <laughs> at, at William Jessup University. Like, I, I'm, a, I'm a 20 year educational veteran in the Sacramento area, and I've been looking up the hill, you know, at, at, at William Jessup University for a long time. Like, this place is like a beacon. Like, Ooh. Right? Like, people here are digging what they're doing. I talk to students here and they're like, I go to school here. I'm like, I wish I did. <laughs> this place is amazing. Um, so I'm just super honored to be here. Um, I'm going to give you a little, a little peek behind the curtain of uh, what happened before this conference. Um, we all, uh, as presenters, got invited to a presenter's dinner. The food was great, by the way. I just bragged a little bit. It was top. It was really good. Um, but all the presenters came to a presenter's dinner a couple weeks back, and I got to meet all the presenters who are going to be presenting sessions today at the conference. And Dr. Herzog, who was the cat who was just up here on stage, he laid down a couple of things that, <laughs> that sign language for mind blown. Um, <laughs> Dr. Herzog said, hey presenters, two things you got to know. First thing, you're all hand-picked for this conference. This conference is incredibly important, not only to William Jessup University and Dr. Herzog, this conference is incredibly important to this region, and it's a unique conference, because we're not all teachers, or all administrators, or all uh, prudential uh, uh, seekers yet. It's a very diverse group of learners. So Dr. Herzog said, hey, presenters, I want high quality presentations. Each one of our presenters were picked today because of the quality they bring to the conference, but also the diversity of thought that they bring to the conference. Because the conference is filled today with people who are 20 year veterans and people who haven't even started in the classroom teaching yet. And so that's a fantastic like realization about what's about to happen here today. The second thing Dr. Herzog said to the presenters was this. Everybody leaves your session today with something that use on Monday morning. So if you're in a classroom, you're a classroom teacher, if you're an administrator, if you're a TOSA, if you're a counselor, you will leave a presentation today with stuff you can whoop, put right to work on Monday morning. Which I love that idea, because I go to a lot of conferences, I'm super lucky that way. I get to go to a bunch of conferences. Sometimes I go into the conference, I see a session on like theoretical mathematics, I'm like, wow. <laughs> I will never use that. But that was amazing. Right? You go to a conference, you, look, you listen to a presenter present on a topic that they've been developing for 20 years, and you're like a first year teacher, and you're like, uh, I'll catch you in 20? So our promise today is this, that you will leave every session today with topics and things that you can use on Monday morning. Now, my job today as the keynote speaker is to, well, I'm going to hug this too. <laughs> no, just take Rogers. Maybe, maybe, woke up, woke up, woke up. Um, my job today as the keynote speaker is to um, prepare you to take that which you learned in the sessions today and apply it on Monday morning. My job is to help bridge you to Monday morning. So I'm going to quick do a roll call, uh, find out who's in the room. How many people are currently an elementary school teacher right now? Elementary? Wow. Thank you so much for teaching kids to read. Like none of us can even read the slide right now if it wasn't for you. Thank you. So the elementary school teachers in the room. How many, how many goofy middle school people out there? Yeah, yeah. me too. Those are the people dancing earlier, right? Like, I'm a big, I'm a big, I'm a right. <laughs> the middle school people jam because they don't care. They hang out with seventh and eighth graders, right? Any high school people out there, high school, you are the last touch before we kick them out into college and career readiness, right? So thank you for doing what you're doing. Any um any, any like preschool, like a uh, uh, pre? Any, any high, nice, yes, right? We should be pouring into that part of the industry right now. We all know we should be shifting our resources toward you. Any uh, higher ed folks, any college folks? Yep, 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 right on. Thank you for doing what you do. You shepherd us all into the industry. Any, any, any educators who are outside of the classroom, like uh, you're an administrator or a teacher on special assignment, it's a safe room, you can admit it, it's good, it's good. <laughs> 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 Poor teachers on special assignment lost their lunchroom, right? There used to be a teacher that became a teacher on special assignment. Everybody's like, 
aren't you admin now? <laughs> no, I'm still teaching. It's in the title. Teacher on this design. Um, that's a really important gig, that toasting gig, and an admin gig. Somebody's got to keep the, the lights on and the, and the place running. Thank you uh, for doing that. Are there any people here, and I know you're here because I sat with some of you already. Are there any people here who are currently working on your credential? Give us people a round of applause. Hey, if you aren't getting a credential right now, or if you're in your first five years of teaching, like lean in. Thank you for actually doing this. Also. <laughs> so people take the cues, they're like, really? <laughs> what, do you, what do you got? Hey, if you're in the first five years of teaching, or if you're in your credential program, here is this is my nugget for you. Don't listen to the rest of the keynote. Don't give up. Amen. 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 The first five years of the teaching program, or uh, uh, the teaching experience, is, 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 a, is a whirlwind roller coaster. Things are moving so fast, you can't even understand how the game's being played. You're in the classroom talking as fast, you go, boom, spit water. Where'd that come from? No idea. Right? Just keep teaching. Don't worry about it. Because by the, no, because by the fifth year, by the fifth year, the game slows down. And it's like the movie The Matrix, right? The spit water's coming, the whole world goes into slow <laughs> Go to the principal's office. Right, so, like, <laughs> but my, my, my point is this, if you're in the first five years or if you're in a credential program, here's the deal, like, it is a tough gig. I know we make it look easy. It's a hard job, but don't give up because in that sixth year, the whole game changes and you go, oh, I get it. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Uh, thank you for being here. We have such a diverse group of learners. So I'm mean, trying to demonstrate that we have uh, a, a preschool, an elementary, middle school, and high uh, admin and TOSAs, and we have credential candidates here. Um, this is a diverse group of learners today, and today I want to talk about um, taking what we learned today and stretching it out into the future, into a Monday morning, and into our careers. Uh, quick checkup from the neck up. This is a whoop, like a formative assessment. Um, scale of one to five. Uh, where are you personally on spontaneously learning something new and putting it to use in your life? Um, scale of one to five, where are you at on learning something new just spontaneously? Like something just comes your way, you're like, oh, that's interesting. I'm gonna scratch it, I'm gonna learn it, I'm gonna use that, I'm gonna put it to use in my classroom. A five would be like, oh yeah, I love learning. I read everything. I put the cereal box in front of me in the morning, I'm like, oh, I wonder what a monosorbate looks like in, 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 in real life. Yes, I have to stop wondering about that monosorbate thing. Learners, you're a five. You didn't even know there was an ed conference today. You just smelled coffee. You're like, what's going on here? What's going on? Right? A five would be like, even if we didn't create programs today, you'd be like, I'll walk in any classroom. I don't care. Like, what are you guys? Advanced little mathematics. Cool. I'm a kindergarten teacher. Bring it. Right? You don't care. You're a five. Like, learning your jam. Like, I'll tell you what, there's some people in this room, I don't know, they're five. They can drive by a billboard and they're like, I'll put that to use in my classroom. I'm on the way to work. Changing their lesson plans today. Learn something off of a podcast, right? Uh, you're a five. That's, a three is like, hey, I'm a learner. I like to learn. But the truth is, I've been burned. <laughs> hey, I found a Barnes and Noble. I picked up that book. It looked like a good book. I thought I was going to learn some stuff. I forgot my teacher was bored to get the numbers, so I had to pay full price for the book. And then I just sat on my nightstand. I never got to that thing because I'm a three. Here's the deal. I love learning, but like, I got a lot going on in my life. I can't just take every new idea and implement it. I've got lesson plans for this week and next week, and actually for the next 33 weeks. The truth is, um, I have a new thing I'm going to learn. I'll use that next year, but it's only October. I know that I planned out to June, right? <laughs> and that's okay. If you're a three, you're like, it's, it's okay. You're a planned person. It's spontaneous learning. Maybe it's your jam. That's okay. So five is like, woo! Let me see learning, right? Five is like, you know, you go to the cashier, and they got to ask me about the rewards program button, and you're like, I only want the rewards program, but I just like to learn stuff. Tell me about the rewards program. <laughs> you're a five, right? You're, you're like two feet in the water, bloop, duck, diving. A three is like a toe in the water. You're like, hey, I like to get, I'm cool. I, I can sell it. <laughs> you see what's that? What's going on? I don't want to learn, so I know what I'm going to learn, right? A one is like, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're a one, use this finger. There you hold it up, just. You know, what? That's what it is, right? Like, the one is like, hey, look, I've learned a lot. I'm a 20 year veteran. I got a whole filing cabinet full of worksheets. I used the same worksheet that worked 20 years ago. I'm like, cool, I don't need to learn anything else. Like, I've had my same lesson plans for October 7th, and the same day every year, the same one, there it is. I, I, I just, I heard the food was good at the conference. 
So I came to the conference, right? Right now, I was. Scale of one to five. Where are you at on learning something spontaneously and putting it to work? I'm gonna do a check after the night. Don't, don't hold it up high. Don't be like, oh, I'm a five. Because your partner's sitting with you. She's really a three. She's had the same folks on her night stage since Obama was president. But she has a three. Right? Just me and you, like eyeball to eyeball, check up from the neck and hold it low. Scale of one to five. Who's in the room? One, two, three, go. Where are you at? Cool. Cool, four. Cool, five. Right. Pitch, be honest. This thing is appropriate. This is appropriate. <laughs> cool. Little gate cluster over there. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Great. You know, the reason I ask you that is because I've got this, I've got this theory about learning that I learned from a mentor ooh, many years ago. I'm going to drop on you today and back it up with a little bit of theory and see if it doesn't take hold and help you take today's lessons and apply them on Monday morning. Um, it's good to see we have some, some learners in the room. Um, oh, hi, that's me. I'm John. <laughs> yeah, hi, thanks for saying something. Um, there's a picture of me. I've been drawing that on desk since fifth grade. If you got one in your class, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> that's my little website right there, learningwithjohnack.com. Everything that I talk about today is on my website because that way I talk kind of fast. You're like, what do you say? Don't worry about it. It's on the website. Um, all my resources I use are on the website. So you can jam there today. Uh, if, if I said something you want to go look up later, I'm going to be on the last slide too. No need to write it down. Um, here we go. Uh, I want to talk about the rubber band theory. I want to talk about rubber band theory. It's a theory that got dropped on me many years ago by a cat named Dan Kelly. I, I was a high school teacher. I love that gig, man. Um, I was a high school teacher, and somehow I accidentally became the high school principal. That's a whole other story. Um, I woke up one day as a high school principal of a large urban high school here in Sacramento. It was an interesting gig. I love the kids. I love the community. But it was kind of a tough gig, right? It was right before the recession hit. It was like 2005, 2006. You know, fast forward two years, everybody gets laid off, right? Fast forward the story. It's the, the recession hits. Everybody loses their job. Tough gig. Um, uh, at this point in time, like if you had a good program, like don't hold on to it. It all got cut in the recession hit. Um, it's 2005, 2006, I become a principal, you know, in this kind of rough neighborhood. There's kids over here, you know, wearing red. There's kids over here wearing blue. And those aren't the school colors, right? It was just kind of a rough deal. We, we loved up on these kids. But how do we change this school into the school that we want it to become? And then it was like a movie. Like, like this sage mentor just appeared next to me. Having a rough day? <laughs> Dan Kinley. He got hired into my district and he kind of coached me into a theory called rubber band theory that changed my whole life. It changed my understanding of learning and applied learning. Dan said, hey, first thing you gotta do if you wanna change the situation that you're in is you gotta look up. Quit looking down. I was looking at suspension rates, I was looking at low test scores, I was looking at fight time. He said, look up and look over. He said, to make change, you need to have three things. The first thing you need is a desired state. He said, you gotta have a North Star, a guiding light, a desired state, a place you wanna be. And at this time in my career, I wanted my high school, five years from then, to be this amazing place with a culture of kids learning and students and staff working together. I had a desired state. He said, keep your eyes on the desired state. Understand that the desired state can't be like real close. It can't be like, oh, I'm 40 pounds overweight, I'm gonna lose one pound by tomorrow. Let's celebrate with a donut. You know, it can't be, it can't be that simple. It's gotta be over the horizon. Your desired state's gotta be out of reach. The reason I tell you that today is because you're gonna go into some conference sessions today and you're gonna learn from some presenters some potential information for your desired state. You're gonna go into a session on augmented reality or advanced level mathematics, you're gonna be like, I can't do that on Monday, but that could become part of my desired state. So Dan Kennedy said you need three things to manage change or to manage your learning. He said number one, you need to have a desired state. He said number two, oh, video pause. I didn't realize there was a video. Oh, I was playing YouTube. Has that been on for a long time? That's super exciting. I was playing a remote time. Before you guys got out here, do you want to continue watching? I feel like I want to play some remote time. Now let's just close that out. Let's go back here. We'll play the remote time later, maybe. Dan Kennedy told me you need three things to manage change toward your desired state. First, you need a desired state. He said, number two, you need to understand your current reality. 
A real checkup on the neck. You need to know where you are, where you stand within that paradigm between where you are versus where you want to be. He said the third thing is, all you're armed with is a rubber band. He says, all you can do is understand your current reality and want to be in your desired state. And all you can do is stretch that rubber band in the direction of the desired state. He says, you know, a rubber band is like learning itself, right? When you feel the tension, you know it's working. The rubber band is kind of an analogy for learning or for change. If you stretch it as far as you can in the direction of your desired state and hold on. Nobody can stretch your rubber band for you. This is one of the mistakes we often make. We tell people, hey, there's a desired state over there. Let me come and help you. And we stretch someone's rubber band too far, too fast, the rubber band snaps. If you stretch that rubber band too far, too fast, it snaps, it hurts your hands. You're like, you know what? That change was not that important. I'm just going to go back to the final cabinet and do what I've always been doing. It was a fun conference. The food was good, but we'll stay with the worksheet. Right? The idea is that if you have a desired state of what your classroom want, you want it to look like five years from now, and you learn something today at the conference that you can start to craft a desired state around, and you really understand your current reality, then you can stretch your rubber band in the direction of your desired state and just hold on. Try one new thing, one pedagogy, one product, one tool, one process. Just try that one new thing. Try it and feel the tension. And allow it to just work and hold on to it and just keep trying it. Try it once, try it again. It fails, try it a third time. Try it 27 times because eventually what's going to happen is that rubber band is going to become a little practice or a protocol that you're good at. It's going to become a habit. It's going to become something you already know how to do. And eventually, before long, that rubber band is going to give. And immediately, you try the next thing. And before long, you make your way over to your desired state. Dan Kimley coached me on this rubber band theory. He said, if you understand your desired state and you really, really know your, your current reality, you can stretch your rubber band one stretch at a time. Just do one thing at a time. And eventually, you'll make it over to a place that you never imagined you could be. Now, the next piece of that is some people have these crazy, ridiculous, like huge rubber bands, right? They're like the fives in the room, who are the fives, right? You got these big, elastic rubber bands, and oh, desire to look, I'll try something new. What? I'll try something new on day two. Oh, I'm weird. I can make change, no problem. Some of us have a different rubber band. Some of us have, um, you remember those rubber bands we had on our braces? <laughs> oh, that's all I got! That's it, no, I'm stressed! That's a fine man! That's it, that's it, that's it! It's my cheese bag, okay? Oh, oh, look, it's working! Oh, it's working! Oh, it's working! Oh, right? Right? That's okay! It's okay because here's the trick. Nobody can stretch your rubber band for you. You can't go to that professional development where your administrator goes, here's the desired state staff, let's all go. All you can do is allow other people to help you create a desired state. Good new ideas from a conference like this will help you create a desired state that you are in charge of your rubber band, whether it's the little one, the medium or the big one. So the idea of rubber band theory uh, helps move you toward future orientation, but there's some great research behind this. Uh, have you ever heard of Carol Dweck, right, growth mindset? Carol Dweck wrote this book called, um, called Mindset, right? Uh, it really shouldn't be called Mind Blown, because we all read this book a few years back, it was like, whoa, I can use that on Monday morning, right? Right, I got some head nods for the growth mindset. Carol Dweck says one of the most powerful words in the English language is the word yet. She says the word yet opens possibilities to the future. Anything I can't do, if I just attach the word ah, yet to it, it actually opens up neural pathways in my brain that says, oh, maybe I can do that someday. I only can't do that yet. I only can't make this stretch work yet. There's a growth mindset piece that she talks about. She did some amazing research on fifth graders. She took these fifth graders, she gave them a test that they couldn't possibly pass, which was kind of mean. <laughs> right. She gave a test that they couldn't possibly pass, and then she stood back and observed what happens when these people met this challenge that they couldn't possibly accomplish yet. And she immediately separated these kids into two groups, kids with a growth mindset and kids with a fixed mindset. She said the kids who attacked the problem that couldn't be uh, solved yet, and immediately went, oh, I can't do that. I, it's not something I can do. When she studied their brain waves, what happened was their brain chemistry went flat. The screen went dark. They were lit up like a Christmas tree. Okay, I'm getting ready for this test. Here we go. It's going to go beep, 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 beep. Oh. Flat. Because they realized right away, hey, I can't, I can't, I can't accomplish that which is set in front of me. And so therefore, they stop learning. Fascinating discovery. The students with a growth mindset, their brains actually lit up. 
like a Christmas tree when they met a challenge that they could not accomplish yet. They started saying, hey, well, maybe I can't. This looks like something I've tried. What if I might try this one thing? Actually, learning occurred for those children during the time of perseverance and struggle. Oh, as classroom teachers were like, I want those kids. Can I just get the growth mindset cluster? Right? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna give all kinds of stuff they can't do and just let them teach themselves. I'll see you at the end, right over there. <laughs> right? Right. What, what's amazing about this is that she also found that it can be learned. That we all have a fixed mindset around certain topics, we all have a growth mindset around certain topics. I think we know that as adult learners, um, but that a growth mindset can be learned. She said, the culture of your classroom matters. The culture of the classroom matters because it's the way that we approach problems, it's the way that we approach learning, it's the way that we approach solving. If a student says, why do I ever have to learn PEMDAS? And you say, well, because it's on the test. <laughs> Fixed mindset. I'm like, cool, it's on the test. So I have to know the test. When the test is over, stop knowing it. Go back to Fortnite. <laughs> right? What we want is lifelong learners, continual learners, growth mindset learners, so they're like, hey, we're learning this. Uh, it's a, the application might be partially on the test, but I'm gonna apply it to other things. I'm constantly growing, I'm constantly learning. When we want that, we can develop that in our classrooms by building a classroom culture that grows a growth mindset. Uh, anybody ever heard of uh, Rita Pearson? Yeah? You look, it's a five minute YouTube, you, you gotta go watch it, it's amazing. Rita Pearson's on fire, right? She, I love what she says, she says, uh, kids don't learn from people they don't like. And it's true, kids don't learn from people they don't like, right? So if you don't like a kid, don't let them know. If there's one you don't like, fake it. Kids won't learn from people they don't like, and kids like people who give them a positive self-perception. Rita Pearson has a growth mindset in her classroom because she does something amazing with kids. For example, she says in one of her YouTube videos, she says, I gave a 20 point quiz, and this child Missed 18 out of 20. She said, did I put a big negative 18 with a frowny face? Nope. Did I put a two over 18 just to make them sure they knew how to do it? Nope. Rita Pearson says I put a big plus two and a smiley face. And the kid says, why are you giving me a smiley face? We're only two right. She says, because you're on your way, right? You only don't know the other 18 <laughs> yet. It's these little practices, this little, uh, uh, this paradigm that we put into our classroom culture that said you were all learners. What Rita did for that child was she gave that child a self-perception of like, oh, I'm only not there yet. I only can't do this yet. There's no need for me to have a fixed mindset on this topic because the learning never stops. I only haven't gotten those other 18 questions yet. So she's fostering a growth mindset in the classroom by the very culture that she's creating uh, with the way that she interacts with kids. She's empowering kids to have a different uh, self-view. I would love it if the keynote stopped right now and we could all be like, cool, I got a rubber band, I go watch the Rita Pearson video, I'm gonna go be a better teacher, right? But it's, it's not enough uh, to give these analogies. It, it, we need some models. You need some models that you can actually put into use and into practice. These are research-based and evidence-based models that we can use to develop a growth mindset in our students, in ourselves, and a rubber band culture in our classroom, in our schools, and even in the cohorts where we're learning right now in college. So I'm gonna unpack a couple of models. The first model, I was like, look at using the pointer because it's really cool, right? I'll go with that. Um, the first model is called SAMR, Substitution Augmentation Modification Redefinition, and that one I, I kind of say is for teachers. For us, when we're trying something new for ourselves in the classroom, I'm gonna encourage you to use the Sander model to develop a growth mindset in yourself. The second one is the model of social and emotional learning, and this particular model that you see here I'm gonna talk about today is from CASEL, the Collaborative for uh, Academic and Social Emotional Learning. Um, and that model we're gonna talk about today, I say it's for students, but I throw a little question mark on it. My wife's like, uh, is that a table? Is it a question mark? I said, you know where I'm going. This is for students. Having strong social emotional learning competencies poured into our students will make our students better citizens with pro-social behavior. It's for students. You know any adults who might need some social emotional learning competencies with some pro-social behavior? Right, you'll leave that at your table. Um, <laughs> right. 
So let me dive in and unpack a couple of these models and see if it helps us start to think about how we can stretch our own rubber bands and create a rubber band culture in our classroom that leads all of us and our students to our desired state. The first model is the SAMR model. I told you it stands for substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition. Um, the idea of SAMR is that it's an implementation model. It's when you want to try something new in your class, you want to try something new in your profession, but you go to the conference today, you watch this fantastic session on using Chromebooks in the classroom to create literature circles, you're like, that's awesome! I want that to be part of my desired state! I want my classroom to be a technology-infused classroom where students have digital literacy skills and are rocking with each other on Chromebooks. That's my desired state. Thanks for that presentation, my current reality. What's a Chromebook? <laughs> I wouldn't know how to start that. The SAMR model gives us the, the tools to create a desired state, but to start with substitution. SAMR says, start with substitution. The tool that you're introducing acts as a direct tool substitute with no functional change. You already do something pretty well. Find that something that you do well and replace it with a new tool, a new process, a new procedure that you learn at the conference today. So uh, my example would be this. Uh, in my classroom, I always throw up a journal prompt on the board. The kids come in, uh, right, for passing period. They sit down, they get out their spiral notebook, and they start to respond to the journal prompt on the board. Truth is, I'm brewing coffee and taking attendance. That's what, no, it's right, it's about right. So they're right. <laughs> And I have the kids use the spiral notebook because it's easy. They got the backpack, they got the spiral notebook, they turn it to me, they get some points on top. We know the points are meaningless, they go in the grade book, it's all false. Um, <laughs> oh, better keep it. Um, the, the idea though is I come to this conference and I'm like, hey, Chromebooks. I would love to have a technology infused classroom, but it's scary to me. That desired state out there is, is revolutionary. The idea that I have kids on Chromebooks and sharing docs and, and doing research and blogging and uh, posting to the World Wide Web, that, that, that desired state is terrifying to me because I, in my current reality, don't rock the Chromebook. I rock the spiral notebook, which is a real thing. Um, so in the Santa models, you start with substitution. I got my desired state, I want a technology infused classroom. I got my current reality, I don't know what really the Chromebook is able to do. I start with substitution, I get one practice, Spiral notebook, journal problem, and replace it with the new tool. Okay, I think I can manage this. This is the first stretch of the rubber band. I think I'm able to have my kids come in, get out the Chromebook, open up the Chromebook, log into the Chromebook, open up a Google Doc, look at the board, and instead of writing the spiral notebook, they just write on the Chromebook. That's it. I did it. It's not overwhelming. It's something I can manage, and I can do it for as long as I need to do it in the SAMR model. SAMR model start, says start with substitution. So I'm like, I got it. Let's do it for a day, let's do it for a week, let's do it for a month, let's do it for six months. If at some point I say to myself, oh my goodness, we totally got this. We've got it. The kids are getting out their Chromebooks, they're rocking their Chromebooks, their, their journal prompt is happening every day. If at some point this new process becomes habit, I'm ready for something else. I'm ready for a new process, a new little pedagogy, a new little twist that leads me in the direction of my desired state. So again, I came to the conference, I started creating a desired state, I started with substitution, just substitute one thing, which may lead to augmentation, where the tool itself adds some functional change. Right, we recognize a Chromebook is not the same as a spiral notebook, we get that. There's a functional change there. The kids have been working on it for a while, and so I'm like, hey, wait a minute. I realize that I tell the kids often when you're doing your journal, you can draw a picture that helps you engage with the topic. Well, now they've got the Chromebook. Here's a functional change. While you're writing, jump out on the internet, find a picture that relates to the topic that we're writing on, and insert the picture. Well, now we're starting to have some functional change in the lesson plan. We started with just a substitution, and all of a sudden we're on to augmentation, and before long, we crossed the transformation line into like modification. Now we're actually modifying the original task. We're actually doing things that we couldn't do before with the spiral notebook, right? So we start with the substitution, a little bit of augmentation. We get over here and we realize, hey, wait a minute. These kids are responding to a journal prompt on the board and they're creating an argument. And what do we want our students to do in class? We want them to defend their argument. With what? With primary sources. Hey, while you're doing this journal prompt and inserting a picture, jump out on the whoop and find some authors who defend your argument and use those authors as defense in your argument. 
Well, now we've totally modified the original intent, right? This, this lesson has transformed from a spiral notebook and a pen, but the tool has allowed us to transform it into something totally new. Now we're talking about defending argument. And the last piece is redefinition. The reason I love this one is because it says this. The tool that allows for a task, wait for it, that was previously inconceivable. Which is freeing, because that means we've arrived at a place that before we couldn't even imagine what it would look like. So there's no pressure back here in the beginning to imagine what it's gonna look like at the end. The job is to start with substitution and to work the process and allow it to grow and allow it to change because when you get over here, you'll realize that Chromebook can do things you didn't even realize it could do and now you've been able to redefine this lesson in your classroom by following the steps of substitution, augmentation, modification, redefinition. Maybe our students now, we realize, hey, you're responding to the journal prompt, you're throwing in a picture, you're defending your argument with primary sources from the internet, but you know what? You guys are doing a great job writing. Why don't you post that up onto a blog post and then the peers within the classroom can respond to each other's blog posts by dropping comments. If I would have thought about that when I was over here, I would have been so scared, I would have gone back to the filing cabinet and been like, we're just gonna stick with the handle of the worksheet. Let's just do the worksheet. Because it's so terrifying to think about redefinition. So the, the goal is don't. Don't think about redefinition. Think about a desired state and start with substitution, and Samuel will lead you to a place that was previously inconceivable. So that first model right there is really for us. Right, for the teachers. How do we take something from today's conference, allow it to become part of our desired state, and then stretch toward it? Use the Santa model. On Monday, when you get back to your classroom, on Monday, take something from today's conference, figure out on the way home, how can I substitute one thing in my classroom with one nugget I learned from today? And you'll be on your way, stretching toward your desired state for your classroom. Now the next model is, Castle is the collaborative for academic and social and emotional learning, um, social and emotional learning competency model. This is really important to me because in 2018, I think we spent enough years uh, teaching toward you know, standardized academic outcomes, which I understand are important, um, but we've spent so much time talking about academics that we've lost our way and uh, we can't see the forest through the trees. You know, as teachers, as educators, we didn't get into this industry because we loved our content. We got this industry because we love kids. Now, I, if you love literature, you're like, oh man, I love me some literature so much, I'm gonna go teach literature. Actually, when you get to your classroom, you're not gonna look out a sea of literature, right? You're gonna look out a sea of faces that belong to children, those children belong to parents, and those people are incredibly important to our communities. And so, we've spent so much energy focusing on the academic development of our students, and we've left up to communities to develop the social and emotional competencies of our students, that I think we've missed our way a little bit. And California's starting to come around on this. California just released the framework for social and emotional learning, and over the next, you know how slow it moves, over the next, hopefully five years, 15, over the next five <laughs> or 15 years, California's gonna come along and we're all gonna eventually have social and emotional learning curriculum in our classrooms. It's gonna help develop the students 15 years from now. I would like you to start on Monday. It's 2018, and I don't have to go into why, but we all watch the news and we look at what's going on. You know, our kids are academically more, uh, more uh, empowered than they've ever been in human history. I know everybody always talks about the failing education system, our test scores are low. These are the hardest tests kids have ever taken in human history. Right? Our kids are doing great academically. I don't know that this is where we're doing our best work, is in the social and emotional learning piece. And so I'm going to pour this into you a little bit today. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about it. Um, Castle breaks down the social and emotional learning competencies into five areas. And I want you to imagine yourself as a classroom teacher, and imagine yourself as a group full of kids who came into your classroom. Imagine your grade level, so they're fifth grade. These kids come into your fifth grade classroom for the last five years, kindergarten through fourth, people have been pouring social and emotional learning competencies into them. And they walk into your classroom with self-management skills, self-awareness skills, Social awareness, including things like empathy, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making skills. Yeah. 
I'd be like, oh, I'll never retire. <laughs> this is awesome, right? Imagine your students came into your classroom like that. Now here's the thing, I'm gonna tell you, we're gonna have pro-social behavior, better behavior, less bullying, it's gonna be great. We're all gonna be singing kumbaya, loving up on one another. But uh, we're also here for the academics. And what we're gonna find is that pouring into kids social emotional learning uh, competencies allows them to access the academics, allows them to have things like grit and perseverance and, and the skills that they need to get where they're going academically. So these learning competencies uh, lead to studies like this one. And what you'll see is when kids receive social and emotional learning competencies over a period of years, what you start to see is a 9% increase in pro-social behavior. Now I'm not gonna unpack what pro-social behavior looks like in this study, but we all know what anti-social behavior looks like, right? A 9% increase in improved uh, awareness of self and others, awareness, of self and others, right? Uh, I'll jump forward because the last piece there is the 11% increase in academics. What's sad to me is that that's the one we have to use to sell. We're like, hey, you want academic growth? Pour into social emotional learning. As if the first couple indicators weren't good enough reasons to pour into kids. We have to say, hey, you're gonna see 11% growth in academic success. Well, um, the reason I think this is so important is because if we want our students to create a desired state in their own learning and have a growth mindset that says, hey, I'm on a journey heading toward my own desired state, then we can't be stretching the rubber bands for them. We need to teach them the skills to stretch their own rubber band. And we don't do that. Our academic standards, which are brilliant, uh, teach all about the step-by-step -step academic requirements to arrive as an educated person in the 21st century, but we forget that there are skills needed so they can manage their own learning along the way. Uh, and I would say these skills are good for us adults too. I, I, I love the graph. I'm gonna tell you a little story because I think the narrative helps. Uh, I was at a, uh, at a lecture by Ray Johnson over here at Bayside in Rockland about 10 years ago. It was a nighttime lecture uh, on raising kids because I got a whole bunch of them. Um, and I wanted to learn some stuff. I'm a five. Uh, <laughs> and, Ray Johnson said something that blew my mind. He started talking about the juxtaposition between sophistication and maturity. It immediately dawned on me. I was a classroom teacher. I was like, I know what I want. I want really mature students with really low sophistication, <laughs> right? Because sophistication is understanding or access to adult level content. Sophistication is understanding of adult level content, right? And so I don't want to be able to build a volcano in my classroom and have all the kids come in. I'm going to pour the baking soda in, wait for it. They want them all to go, ooh, ah, right? Then I want low sophistication. They've never been exposed to a chemical experience like this. This is awesome, except now they all have YouTube. And they're so sophisticated that this is not present to them at all. Ray Johnson said this was 10 years ago. He said, we might have the most sophisticated group of students that we've ever had in human history, right? These might be the most sophisticated group of human beings we've ever had in human history. They've been exposed to more adult level content than any other human in the history of human beings. So they're walking into my classroom and I got the little volcano and that is not interesting to them because they are so sophisticated, they've already experienced something similar to that, and so they're like, check, you're old. <laughs> but you're not, so you got this. Uh, I want kids who are really low sophistication, and I want high maturity, and what is maturity? Maturity is defined as, um, as uh, reacting appropriately to adult level content, right? So I pour the thing in the volcano, the volcano's like, ooh, ah. But every once in a while, the ball, volcano's gonna make something funny, right? And I want all my kids to go, um, we totally understand that there are chemical reactions such as this. It's not the case that a, a sound is made that is similar to flatulence, and that will not make us laugh at all. If we're very mature, we don't have to react to adult level content. Is that what your class is like? <laughs> That's not what your class is like, right? Right, um, well, yeah. We want kids who are not sophisticated, but really mature. And what I learned about 10 years ago during this lecture is we might have the most sophisticated group of human beings ever in the history of human beings and the least mature group of human beings ever to have walked the planet. I'm not putting them down. I love them. I own three of them in my own house. Um, but uh, 
Because maturity is developed through adult interaction. If you're sitting at the dinner table five nights a week and you're watching your two parents discuss adult level content, you start to learn a mature manner in which we react to adult level content. If you are part of a soccer club and you've known that coach, that coach for multiple years, that coach is like family to you, and that coach holds you to a high standard of maturity, you start to learn how coaches interact with parents and parents interact with parents, and then kids start to model that, and that's what grows maturity. We become mature by watching the adults in our lives react to adult level content. <laughs> right. Because at this particular place in human history, because we all have three jobs and working families and uh, 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 iPads and iPhones and i everything, um, we might be pulled away from those adult student interactions. We may not be watching people react to adult level content in a mature fashion that allows us to become mature. And so this generation may be getting less maturing influences than generations in the past. So here we now have the most highly sophisticated group of individuals ever to be young in the human history who are also having the least amount of maturing influence that's ever been given out to a group. Welcome to teaching. <laughs> Open your door. Buckle up. Now, I only tell you this because there's an antidote that we're going to talk about. It. Um, but here's a couple of statistics I want to show you to prove the point, right? Is 65% of 14 through 18 year olds go to YouTube daily as a primary source of information. 65% of 14 to 18 year olds go to YouTube daily for primary source of, uh, of information. What is the number one piece of information that teenagers like to get from YouTube? Content produced by other teenagers. Great. So, <laughs> right, the blind leading the blind out there on YouTube. Okay, fine. Well, it's juxtaposed to this a particular uh, uh, instance that 20% of 14 to 18 year olds use the printed text or journals or publications or magazines as primary sources for information that they speak with about their peers. So only 20% of the things that they bring in are something that's published or edited that we would traditionally call like legit maturing factor to be consuming uh, as opposed to the YouTubes, right? Um, we have 128 times per day a 14 to 18 year old sends a text message. That's 128 text messages a day going out, which I'm assuming if you have that many friends, you have 128 text messages coming in, and that means that we have 128 times per day information being exchanged as primary source between children, and that's fine. The problem is, is we're not up 2018, and the average number of minutes per day that a child spends interacting with their parents is seven minutes. Just seven minutes of maturing factor poured into every child. Now, if every text message took 10 seconds, that's 128 times 10 divided by 60, that's 21 minutes a day of content between children and seven minutes a day of sorting out what it means with an adult. Okay, we just play in balance, that's all. It's just like the scale is a little tip. No problem, we'll fix it. The other thing is this, that for the first time in human history, one of the largest maturing factors that will ever take place in our own experience, kid, uh, birth through 18 years old, is experiencing death. It's a natural part of life. Uh, we now have 18 year olds here in the United States, uh, on average, will view 200,000 fictional deaths portrayed through television and movies and you know scenarios on the internet 200,000 times Birth through 18, you're gonna like see death and process that. Like, what does it mean? How does it affect me? But when I'm gonna see death, only one to three times is on average uh, an 18 year old has experienced death of a grandparent, an aunt or uncle, heaven forbid, a peer. I only bring that up, it's because during those times is typically when family influence rallies. Children are surrounded by family during these important pivotal moments and those are maturing moments. The only problem is, is that for 200,000 other times, the parents aren't rallying around helping them understand, right, uh, what's happened in that movie. 
Now, I don't mean to depress you. I'm the most positive person I know. I believe the future is bright. I just believe that if maturity and the sophistication, the imbalance is part of the problem, then social emotional learning competencies are the antidote. These are maturing factors for our students. Now, if you have a student in your classroom that you want to get to the desired state, and you're pouring into them the algebra lesson, and somewhere along here, the rubber band snaps, and you keep stretching the class, and you end up over here with the whole class, and that kid's over there, you try to go back and grab and pull them along, but it's like dragging somebody, right? Yeah. We need to pour into these children so that when they get here, they know what to do next. You can't be in charge of 30 kids and their rubber bands in your classroom every hour, five hours a day, 180 days a year. That's 192 kids times 180 days. That's too many rubber bands for you to manage. We need to teach the children to manage themselves. Does that make sense? Okay. So, this is what I want to pour into us a little bit here is that uh, these social and emotional learning competencies that come from CASEL, the collaboration for academic and social and emotional learning, uh, 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 lay out like this. Self-management, self-awareness, relationship skills, uh, social, uh, 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 responsible decision-making. I think that's one. Um, imagine this, right? Imagine you have a child who you want to create a desired state, and they are where they are. One of these skills under self-management is goal setting. I want you to imagine whatever content you teach, whatever grade level you teach, if you're teaching literature, if you're teaching mathematics, if you're teaching physical education, just the idea of teaching kids about goal setting, it's not in the standards, it's not one of the academic check marks that's gonna show up on the standardized test, but teaching that student that goal setting skill is a social emotional maturing skill that's gonna help them persevere when things get tough. Teaching kids that over a period of years helps kids learn a growth mindset. The next piece is teaching kids self-awareness. This is a fantastic whole, every one of those, identifying emotions and recognizing strengths. But imagine just on this paradigm right here, students having an accurate self-perception. I told you you need a desired state, that's goal setting. The next thing you need is a current reality. That's an accurate self-perception. I've been in the business of education for 20 years. I get kids walk up to me all the time. They say, I'm gonna turn, I'm turning my life around this year. I said, right on, I'm glad to hear. They said, I'm getting straight A's. I'm like, you've got a goal, I love it. They're like, my current reality, I'm gonna do what I've always done, I'm gonna get straight A's. Hold up a second. You got four F's and a D and PE last semester. <laughs> um, you might wanna have an accurate self-perception and recognize that something's gonna change if you're gonna meet your goal. So I'm glad you got a goal, but let's have an accurate self-perception. Like I said, if you want a technology-infused uh, classroom, awesome. If you don't know what a Chromebook is, fine. You have an accurate self-perception and you can start one stretch at a time. Imagine we taught our kids those skills. I was a high school teacher for a long time, every kid in the whole class. What are you gonna be? NBA player. Yeah, me too. Five, uh, six, three quarters, all of me right here. Right? Accurate self, the great down goals, gotta have them. Accurate self-perception, right? Um, we can teach these skills. Imagine these competencies with no other resources. And on my website, you can go and click on it to Castle, and they have hundreds of resources for you. But imagine with no other resources, you walk out of here today, you print up the one slide that just got the five competencies on it, and you anchor it up on your wall in your classroom. Throughout your day, you will find many opportunities to refer to, hey, let's talk about it. Having an accurate self-perception. Maybe we're reading a piece of literature and we say, does this character have an accurate self-perception? Just by these conversations that we weave into our daily uh, work with the kids, we can be pouring these maturing factors into them. Imagine if, uh, through social awareness, uh, we can help our kids recognize, I'm stretching my rubber band, I have accurate self-perception, I'm moving my, toward my desire state, but hey, how come that kid over there, how come his goal is way down there? Or even more so, what about this kid here, how come his goal is so much shorter than my goal? Right? Having the social awareness in a fully included classroom is incredibly important. In the classroom, in the organization where I work, we have special education students sitting next to English language learners, sitting next to gifted and talented. It doesn't matter who you are at my school, you are fully included in this free and appropriate public education is guaranteed to every one of us. And teaching kids perspective taking, 
that I have an accurate self-perception, I know where I'm going, I know what I'm doing, but I can take perspective and recognize that you have a different goal than me, or a different learning pathway than me, or a different jagged profile, and you have different strengths than I have, that's a powerful thing to teach kids. We often try to attack like bullying problems, for example, by saying, don't bully each other. And all the research on those pro programs have incredibly low rates of return. Because it's not about teaching kids don't bully each other. It's about teaching kids about perspective taking, about empathy, about appreciating diversity, actually recognizing who I am, self-awareness, and who you are, right, social awareness. How are the relationship skills along the way to ask for help is incredibly important. You're gonna go into a session in about 15 minutes, and you're gonna go out and sit down and learn about game theory or advanced mathematics, and you're gonna be like, this is blowing my mind, right? And you're gonna take it and go back to your classroom, and you're like, I'm gonna use this on Monday. Snap, uh oh. And you may stop right there, except that you have the power of social emotional learning competencies as an adult. You get on the internet, and email the presenter and say, hey, could you help me? I tried that one thing you talked about in the session and I, and I couldn't get it to work. You have that skill. You have self-advocacy, right? You will ask for help. Our children, who we just talked about, who are highly sophisticated, incredibly immature, they will not ask for help. They will happily fail before they ask for help, right? They would gladly, quietly fail on the first snap of the rubber band, then ask for help. So we just need to teach them this skill, to have the self-awareness, the perspective taking, the communication skill of like, oh, you're the teacher, I'm the student, we have a particular relationship, and that relationship is founded on communication, and it's okay for me to utilize this relationship and ask you for help. I put all of these, I highlighted all of them, for responsible decision making. Because if I could only have one of the social emotional learning competencies in my classroom, I'd probably take this one because everything leads to it. It's the idea of identifying problems and analyzing solutions of solving problems, evaluating and reflecting. Think about your journey. You're gonna leave here today with a desired state in mind and a rubber band, and you're gonna get out of here, and you're like, ooh, I gotta evaluate how we're gonna implement this. Let me solve this problem. Oh, okay, you're gonna use all of these skills to make decisions along the way toward your desired state. And I know we need to teach kids pen dots. And I know we need to keep, teach kids author's intent. Those standards are important. But if we taught them this deeply, then all that other stuff would become so much easier. So, uh, I'd just like to say that I believe this is relevant in every content area. Some of you look at this and you're like, I want my kids like that. Tell you what we're gonna do. We're gonna do social and emotional learning every Tuesday and Thursday uh, from 1 o'clock to 1.15, except our rapid days, and sometimes we have a spirit day on Thursday, so we can't do that. Anyway, that's what we're gonna have the calendar, and that, that doesn't work. This gets woven into every content area. You use this at recess. You use this in the parking lot in the morning on the parents. <laughs> You leave social, emotional, and learning competencies and opportunities for learning in every content area all throughout your day. We are building human beings uh, every day in our classrooms. So in humanities, it's easy, right? Humanities, we're, we're reading a novel, and we get to say, hey, did Huck Finn use responsible decision making there? <laughs> no, he certainly used some self advocacy, right? All uh, right, you got a book on your self perception. Uh, uh, it's easy to humanities because we're talking about the human experience, right? And so what a great opportunity for those of us who teach English language arts and social science to be able to say, hey, I'm gonna hammer these social and emotional learning competencies throughout all of my content when I'm teaching the human experience, right? You can look at the Alexander the Great and be like, let's pull out some of these nuggets and apply them. But sometimes you're like, well, that's more for the humanities. I'm a math person. Right? If we start on page one, we just go straight down. Right? <laughs> I tell you what, I think that social emotional learning competencies are incredibly relevant in mathematics, right? They're head nods out there. I mean, just the just the responsible decision making one alone of problem solving, identifying problems, evaluating, reflecting, those are part of the eight mathematical uh, 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 principles in the state of California right now, right? Uh, uh, 
I, I just, I look across this and I say, if I had this chart on my wall when teaching mathematics, so many times I could reach to it like, hey, let's apply this right here, right now to help you persevere and show some grit through this uh, problem solving and learning. Even last piece there is study skills. Anytime you're teaching a student to study, anytime you're teaching a student to learn, anytime you're having any learning aspect at all, each one of these competencies pops up and shows up in that uh, continuum. So I guess that's my riff for you on social emotional learning competencies. And I hope it wasn't too preachy, but I believe so deeply that our children need the academic content that we're delivering them. But if we're just delivering it so they can get it right on the test, they'll know that and they'll fix mindset. So if we want our kids to be lifelong learners, then we better not just give them the content, but give them the skills to become lifelong learners so they can set their own goals and then have the self-awareness to understand their current reality and the confidence to take those first stretches and evaluate and reflect all the way through until they meet their own goals. I gave you these two uh, models because I think it's important that you, you know, take ideas like the rubber band theory and apply them through models. But really what I want you to leave today with is this. I want you to leave with uh, your job is to walk out of this room and find a presentation that will help you create a desired state. And remember that person is going to try to inspire you to use this on Monday morning. But your job isn't to be there on Monday morning. Your job is to use the SAMR model on Monday morning to substitute one thing in your classroom from today's conference and then stretch. Hold on to that one practice, that one protocol, that one procedure. Hold on tight and eventually it'll become a reality in your classroom and you can do the next stretch. I want you to take a step back a couple of weeks from now though and realize once you've made a few stretches along the way, what social and emotional learning competencies do you use to manage from your current reality to your desired state? And I want you to turn around and pour those same competencies into our kids. Um, hey, my name's John Ike. You can find me on the Twitter, at John underscore Ike. I am honored to be here. I hope you have a fantastic day of learning. Love and strength of the day. Woo-hoo! <laughs>